better talk than this talk will be. Um, uh, and I have 11 slides and then a demo, so we've got to hope, we've got to pray. Could you all please bow your heads? <laughs> um, okay, Nix, what is it? it um, what am I going to say about Nix? This is not the right slides. Um, hang on, hang on, I'll be with you in a second. Um, um, or will I? Okay, okay, okay. Those were my um, additional slides that never got merged in to this, this, this talk. Um, let's make that big. Okay, I'm going to show you how Nix can uh, conquer Cabal Hell. At least I hope I am. Um, and we'll see how we go. Um, in. Um, I'm going to try and uh, give you a bit of an overview of a purely functional package system, sort of a little bit about what that means. There's probably no slide there, but I'll just waffle on a little bit. Um, and uh, just to show you how it's different to kind of like typical package management systems that you all would have used in your day-to-day, -day, like uh, apt and you know Debian package and ports and all that sort of stuff. Um, just just precisely why this is better, um, and you know you guys are here at a functional programming thing, so you guys will have to like it. Um, <laughs> then I'll actually uh, dig into Nix a little bit. Um, uh, just to overview the commands because it's kind of like typical, you know, um, it's a typical pack package manager. There's a bunch of uh, command line utilities that you'll need to know how to use. And then I want to show you uh, how uh, a demo of how we can use Nix and Haskell together uh, to really just to kill Cabal Hell and also just to accelerate your Haskell development so you will not be waiting. You just shouldn't have to wait. We, I can't emphasize this enough, but we should all focus much more on the developer experience and we should not put up with poor tools. Uh, we, we, we have to just keep going. We just have to make things better. Um, and, and Nix is going there. Uh, it's, I'll say something about disadvantages later. Um, okay, hopefully there's something here about purely functional package systems. Um, Basically, uh, you know, in your day to day, let's let's say let's say you work on a project. You work on a couple of different projects. One of them uses Postgres nine. One of them uses Postgres eight four three or something. Um, that can be really difficult if you're on a particular version, say Ubuntu, and you want to install this sort of stuff. Uh, unless it's the blessed packages uh, and uh, and package systems like Apt, they have. They have realized that's a problem, and so usually what there is is there's a couple of different packages. There's, say, pack packages for Postgres 8, maybe a particular version of Postgres 8, and also a separate one for 9. Uh, but this is just a clutch. Um, and what you really want to be able to do is install any package you like and install all its dependencies on the same machine. Why not? There's just some binaries in that, right? Um, so this is, this is what... Um, this is one of the features that you'd get out of these purely functional uh, package systems. Um, the packages that it installs will be immutable and they're usually uh, installed into a sort of read-only file system so you can't accidentally hack them. Um, and I think in a similar way to, to the likes of uh, ZFS and this sort of thing, you end up, because it's immutable, you end up being able to uh, install a bunch of new tools, and if you screwed up royally, you can roll back. And so it's, it's an atomic, it's a sort of transactional uh, way of dealing with uh, package systems. Uh, for instance, while I was uh, preparing this, I ran out of disk space uh, a little while ago in my uh, Nixos VM, and I was busy installing a whole bunch of stuff, and it failed halfway. And so I wasn't in this halfway state, you know, or didn't have half the shit installed that I was trying to install. I had none of the stuff. And, and that, at least in my environment, there's a whole bunch of stuff downloaded in my, in my Nix store. But, um, so the, this is the other thing that you can have. Uh, you can have uh, multiple environments. And that's kind of the idea behind that is 
say, like I said, you have a couple of projects, they've got different dependencies, you want to be able to get a development environment up quickly that's got all the right stuff at your fingertips. So uh, if you need Postgres, if you need this editor, that editor, if you, you need all those tools, it, it should just be easy. It shouldn't be as hard as it is today. You shouldn't have to pull out a tool like Docker just to, just to get a development environment up and running. Um, and uh, usually these, these things are usable as a non-root user, which is also nice. Uh, although these days it's probably not, it's probably not absolutely necessary. Everything runs in a VM anyway. Um, Nix isn't the only one. Uh, I've been watching these, these uh, package systems for many years uh, after, well, just many years of running Linux systems really. And, uh, uh, and also many years of waiting for things like Gentoo to compile the entire KVE <laughs> stack or something on my laptop, which is a 4200 RPM. And it's just, it's just not what you want to do. Um, so there is Nix, of course. I hope you can see it, that's great. Um, and there's this one called Zero Install, uh, and that's, that's still going. I still think it's quite a viable system. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's a general purpose package management system. It's more of a GUI, uh, a GUI app installer. So more of an app store for, for uh, it's cross-platform, so it's more of a generalized app store. And this other one uh, used to be called Auto Package, but I kind of dug in, and it seems to be still alive as this thing called Listola. But uh, I dug in a little bit more, and it linked off to somewhere that was a bit dead. So I, I think it may have died, and Zero Install is the is the only other one that's really surviving. And of course, everyone else is using Nix. Um, but these ideas, uh, yeah, these these ideas have have been used for a decade or so. So all these projects are pretty old. The guy who wrote Zero Install recently uh, rewrote it in uh, OCaml. And so the kind of functional programming chops are kind of, I don't know, they're, they're there. Everyone knows functional programming is wonderful, or functions is wonderful. Um, and, and, and that's... And that's not really all, because Ben wanted me to say more about that. So I'm going to just whip over here to my other slides that I never merged in, which are just my notes from the other day, and just say a couple of quick ones. Um, and I'm going to, if you can see it, ah, oh, yes. Um, I'm just good. This is actually my, uh, this, this window here is my... Uh, that's running Nixos in there. So I've got Nix uh, running on the Nixos uh, operating system. Nixos is a, uh, uh, it sort of takes the Nix package management system to the final conclusion, and that is that the whole, uh, the whole Linux distribution is managed with Nix. And I just wanted to show you that um, all, all the packages get installed side by side into this thing that's called the uh, the Nix store and um, can you add uh, can I make it bigger? Thank you. Yep. Although not really. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. This is a new computer from today and it doesn't drag a lot because of Apple. Um, you should probably explain that why there's this, such a long hash thing. In front oh of yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I don't really know, but it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so it turns out that, say, this PCRE here, it turns out that you could have um, multiple PCREs 8837 on your machine installed side by side, and that might be because it was built with a different version of GCC. Say, uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a different. Uh, package in the end. So the, it's the idea that it, the, the way that it's functional is that all of, all of the inputs to this, this function that produces this output, uh, some of those inputs are like, uh, what did you build it with? Like GCC, um, uh, what version of make, just your whole environment that went into building this stuff. All the inputs are hashed, so this thing is just a cache so all, all the inputs are hashed, and if all the stuff that, uh, 
if all the inputs are hashed, then uh, then you're guaranteed to, to get the same hash and you can just pull it out of the cache. So if you've, if you've got it in your cache or there's a remote binary cache that you can pull stuff from, you don't have to build it. And that's, that's I think, the main boom, boom, that's the main reason to be for this thing. You know, like, you just don't want to sit around building stuff all the time. And, uh, so Cabal sandboxes are great, but who wants to build a uh, lens uh, in three different sandboxes on your machine? Who wants to have those 100 megabytes of, of files and stuff just sitting there? Because, you know, this space, it's quite cheap. People say that to me now. I mean, I've been saying it for a while, but but I'm running an SSD and I've only got a 256 gig SSD, so I really just I just don't think it's true that this space is cheap and time certainly is not. So you don't want to sit around waiting for it to compile. Um, all right, um, let me waffle on. Uh, right, that end doesn't work for that app. Um, Okay, no, I'll get a bail on that. That's no good at all. Let's just go back to the original talk. Okay, so I um, just want to go into uh, a little bit of a Nix overview now. Just, just a few commands that uh, you, you need to know how to type in. So instead of uh, some kind of crazy app cache search, which you, you may be familiar with, um, to query the available packages, you can use this uh, mix and query available, um, and then the the uh, the expression there. Uh, and you can, of course, you can shorten. Uh, it's got you can use QA instead of all that stuff. Um, you install packages with install minus i and uninstall. Uh, uh, for some reason, it ends up being. Uh, the erase, I suppose. Yeah. Um, that's that. Um, this is I uh, sort of said alternatively because when you when you erase something, if you just installed it and it was the wrong thing, you could just roll back, and it would roll back your environment and it would um, it would rebuild your current um, user environment to what it was previously. Uh, and if you want to upgrade all your packages. That's like update, update, type, update, upgrade type thing. What does it roll back to? Like a checkpoint or something? Yeah, yeah. So if you just in, if you installed like five packages in in the one um, in the one command, yeah. so if you did, uh, so it rolls yeah. back the last command. Yeah, basically, it rolls back the last the last command, and the way that it kind of knows about all that is that something that I didn't explain, so it's good that it comes up, um, and that is. Uh, Let's see if I can find something. Yeah. Uh, I'm waiting on the next. Yeah, it doesn't have make by default, but I probably installed Git somewhere. So Git ends up in this this location. So I've installed um, Git using nix nix n minus i minus i git at some point, um, and that's installed it into my user environment. Um, and let's have a look at what that is. So effectively, this is a link uh, into the to the store to a very to a specific version. Is it not big enough? I see everyone squinting. Um, uh, let me maximize that guy. If that helps me. Um, so that uh, git command is in my path. So that this profile that bin directory is in my path. And that's the one. This this gets updated uh, when you when you do uh, nix nix m install commands. I'll, if I back up a little bit, I think it'll be perhaps also a little bit clearer, um, or maybe not, because I probably don't actually know how it works. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't really know how it works, um, but. Uh, it's safe to say that when you install something, it puts a soft link into into your profile, and it uh, it has a whole uh, every time you do like the install, it creates a another 
soft link bin. Somebody help me. There's a term for a bunch of a tree of, of soft links. And so it generates a whole new one every single time that you do that thing. And the, what, all it does is when it rolls back, it, it doesn't try to delete anything or anything like that. It's completely immutable. It just goes back to the previous link bin. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. It's awesome. <laughs> and uh, I just don't understand why we're not all doing this. It, it, yeah, I'll just, I'll go on. Um, um, to try and get back to my slides. Um, bup, 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 bup. Okay. Uh, yeah, we were there. Oh, that's it. I'm out of slides. So um, I'm going to show you now how, how you're supposed to use this stuff to make Haskell development um, uh, wonderful and easy. Is that big enough? I think I can even, you know, um, make that a bit bigger. Um, so I've got a really simple um, uh, example cabal project that I put together the other day. It's not got a lot of code. Um, uh, it's just, oops, don't worry about that. Um, it's just a single little file. It's just a simple interpreter. Um, but the, I guess the key, the key thing about this uh, is that it's not just sort of put Strilla hello world. I've, I've had to use Parsec, and, uh, and Parsec's not normally installed unless you install the whole ha uh, Haskell, uh, um, I don't even know what that thing is called, platform, because uh, I haven't used it for ages. Um, and so I'll show you the, the Cabal file. Um, again, there's nothing really much to it, except that, you know, uh, I depend there on on parsec and these parsec numbers that I need. Um, and um, ordinarily, when you cabal configure, so if you create a, sand, a sandbox here, cabal sandbox init, and then cabal configure, cabal build, or whatever, it'll suck down the sources for parsec and sit there and it'll build any dependencies that parsec has, and you'll just be sitting there um, twiddling your thumbs until it's finished. Um, and that's just, that's, not something people should put up with, it really isn't. Um, uh, people try and get around this by having shared <coughs> sandboxes, um, which, which works to a degree until you screw that sandbox up and you can't fix it manually by what? Mutating that sandbox until you think you've fixed it. Um, <laughs> and this just isn't something functional programmers should be doing. Um, so uh, I, I generally, um, in projects that I have, I create a bin directory and I put things in there. Um, in this case, that's my build script. I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, it uses this cabal to nix command, which I haven't covered yet. Um, sorry, Ben. Um, but you, you, you have to um, nix and install this command, and then you have it on your path. And this automates the conversion of uh, the cabal uh, file into uh, this uh, nix file and after that you can use this standard nix command called nix shell and that will without say that parameter there without running a command the nix shell what it will do is effectively so I run bash but it will drop you in to an environment that has all the right things on the path in this case um, well we can have a look at uh, shell there but it will have GHC the correct version of GHC on the path and that GHC will be configured with the correct packages. Uh, if they aren't on your machine, or if you can't find them in a binary cache, it will download them and build them just like Cabal does, but you're more likely to already have them, you've already built them in some other project, so they're already in your next store, or um, the uh, continuous integration server that some nice uh, fellows have set up has already built it on another machine on the internet and you can just pull it down from there. So you don't have to build it. Um, right, have a quick look at this. Um, this is a this is a, a Nix file. It turns out that um, they the Nix people decided a long time ago now to write their own uh, functional programming language, lazy 
lazy functional programming language. Uh, why they didn't use Haskell, I'm not sure. Um, but this is what happens. It's a, I guess it's a DSL of a kind. And I don't really know it very well. I haven't really had to learn it too much. It's just like Google, get the Stack Overflow, or you know, just, just poke it a bit. But you can see here that um, um, I kind of I've read about this make, make derivation. This, this, this uh, is a sort of standard way of building something. It kind of tells it, oh, I've got all these inputs. Um, this is a function. These are the parameters, I think. Uh, there's parsec, there's the parsec numbers, here's base. Uh, standard M is uh, it's a package that contains a bunch of standard sort of unix -y style tools like make uh, and some other stuff, but I forget what, but um, which you might need to you know, to finish your build. Um, and this this stuff just basically uh, it's just converted from the, the cabal file there. Uh, there's again the list of uh, what's the thing else? Um, dependencies. So um, if I just run that file, um, just works. Um, I don't know about that warning. I'll just clear the screen. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I really. Uh, and then I've just got a quick script that um, uh, that just it just runs it to show that it kind of works, um, uh, but that doesn't really matter. It's it's just a quick evaluator, like it can add one and one and two. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you, no, that's all I'm going to say about that. But I also want to show you. Um, oh, I should have. I should. Where's? Hmm, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a. a Another, another example I've got to show you is, um, I don't know if anyone noticed, but Gabriel Gon, does anyone Gonzalez. Gonzalez, he's released this, uh, this turtle thing, it's a, it's a shell thing in, in Haskell, and uh, I always thought there should be something like that, uh, because it was ages and ages ago that these Microsoft people created something called, not Monad, but it had a name very similar to Monad, and it was a, a functional shell, and uh, just just the whole idea of having a functional shell just seemed to disappear. Um, and and, and um, I think this sort of thing has been tried a few times, but this this looks pretty good. Um, the idea, though, with a shell, I always think that uh, um, you know creating a bash script is so easy. You know, you just via the file, you put some commands in there, you you run it, you execute it, right? And so I want to be able to do the same thing with uh, my Haskell scripts. I don't I want to sit around futzing, cabaling, building, getting an executable, all this stuff. You shouldn't have to do it. Developer experience, you know. Um, and so this is just a really short example, which isn't very clean, but it's a really short example to show you how you can just run turtle shell uh, directly. I'll just quickly show you the the um, uh, the file. It's a really poorly written, just like you would in Bash. You know, there's lots of replication, uh, repeated things everywhere. But it's just your typical quick, crappy Bash script, right? <coughs> but it's a turtle shell script. Um, yeah, so that I don't worry about that. Oh, if using overloaded strings just to do something funky with these strings here. Um, and uh, I just have to import turtle, and um, and it will do sort of bash-ish things. Um, it'll cd make directories, show you what's in the directory, and this type of thing. Um, uh, now, I've, what I what I did was I created this uh, shell mix, and and this time uh, I put turtle here. And, and here. In fact, I just copied the other file and just replaced it with turtle. Um, and I made a turtle example, but that's still just from the other thing. Um, and I can show you that if I just type nick shell, I'll be dropped into an environment without building, without cabaling, blah, blah, blah. And if I want to just play around with that library, 
Now I can just go into GHC and I can import total shell. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I can set overloaded strings and then, you know, I can make a directory. All right. It's that easy. No futzing about, there's the directory. Oh, look, it's, it's the same as typing stuff into your shell. And that's what it should be like. How, however, if I want to run that, or run this whole thing, um, you know, I could build it, but I've set it up. You would have noticed the shebang perhaps at the top there. Um, let me show you the turtle script that, uh, that I wrote. So this is a... This is the turtle script that um, gets run by the shebang. Um, just, just always put that at the top of my <laughs> shells. Um, uh, I need to go. I need to run the shell, which will bring in turtle and whatever else I need, like GHC. And I need to run a command, and that command's just run Haskell with the argument. Um, and that, that's it. It's not really, very, it's not very difficult. Um, and then I've uh, chmod plus x that file. Um, uh, you know, you know what I mean. Hello. Mm -hmm. And then again, um, doesn't work. Oh, um, it did run. It's just something weird going on there with with my bash rc, which happens to run when it invokes bash. That weird stuff at the top there. Um, but uh, yeah. You can see here it, it um, there's the name of the file, does foo exist true, and it deletes the file later on and it prints out uh, whether that file exists and that sort of thing. Believe me, it really is running because I, I didn't get that to run at first and I didn't delete the directories right and it, and it broke. Um, I could also show you, uh, just quickly change this file, just like it's a, it's just a crappy you know, script. So I'm just going to change it. I think it's dropped me into that shell, so I'm just going to drop back. Um, and I should be able to just run it again. And uh, it's just busy now because I've asked it to list all the files in my Nick store. And um, yeah, there's a lot of files in there. Um, there there's a um, Nix, uh, because it's a functional uh, package manager, it, uh, oh, there's a lot of free talk. Um, it, it, it actually works, this store works like the heap. Uh, so it looks like, you know, the, the memory heap. And it's also got uh, a garbage collector as well. So you can install packages willy-nilly. And if you think that maybe you don't need some packages anymore, you can kind of collect, collect the garbage. And uh, you do that by, by running this. It's just, you know, another command that just... And probably my demo won't work after this command because um, <laughs> it'll probably need to fetch things. But I'm just going to try it. I'm just going to run this command, um, which cleans up um, any unused packages from my system. Um, hopefully it is actually going to complete because ButterFS broke my demo. Um, seems to have worked. Seems to have actually freed some disk space. Um, I don't know if anyone's used ButterFS, but um, this snapshot thing um, just doesn't get, take care of itself. Um, and so I'll just try and run that again. Oh, 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 it worked straight away. Oh, it's good. <laughs> I, I didn't know if it would. And that, that's it. That's all we've got. Finished. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, my question is maybe a bit funny, I don't know if you know it, but I was wondering when I played it up with Nix, why does it set a date of first of first of oh, it's, it's just a bug. Yeah, do you see it's 9.55 a.m.? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a bug with uh, KDE and then the, the, there's somebody working on it. In that. the store for all files it sets oh, it to oh, basically Timestamp zero, yeah. but uh, that it is intentional. But I yeah. haven't found an, an oh, explanation in the store, why they do it. Why they keep the, the same file? Uh, they touch it with yeah. first. Of that January would make sense deserves. because they um, all 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 inputs. They want to look at all inputs and the hash all inputs, and that might include the the, the um, 
you know, even the permissions on, on a file and the um, and the, um, the the timestamp of the file, the create date of the, the file is supposed to be completely immutable. So if you actually update a file, it changes it changes the file even if you just touch it, it changes the date. So there's probably something to do with that. Um, I'd, I'd imagine. Um, I thought you were talking about this thing, which is just a bug. Um, I think I think it gets it right um, here, although I'm in DC. But yeah. Um, does anyone know? I'd love to have seen them on the Nexus, but that's not finished yet. It's not configured yet. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's. Uh, I think I thought I heard something about GNOME or something that uh, I used to be a big KDE fan. I used to run uh, I don't know something back in the nineties that that was a KDE and uh, and I quite like it. I'm, I'm happy to run with it. I, I just need a shell. You know. Um, any other questions? Yeah, you run the next shell. So what if? if Constructs the environment you've requested on the fly. Yeah. Out of so you, does it go away when you when the shell goes away? Well? Yeah. When you exit the shell, the shell's gone like normal. So the it's shell just, goes away. Does it undo the symlinks and throw away uh, the environment to construct? Uh, well, um, yeah, yeah. It, it it does. It will create a, It will create an environment just for that one shell. But there is a um, user environment. There's also a system environment. So there's sort of a hierarchy of environments. Okay. And I believe that you can even stack more on there yourself. But I, so I can choose to have a system environment. I don't know how to do that. There is a graph on the website, like in the manual, that shows that a little bit. Yeah. I I'm just kind of curious whether it creates the environments, uses them, throws them away because they're so, so light. Yeah, and, and, and you, can, you can imagine doing it yourself. I used to do this. I used to install things into uh, Tilde local directory. And I used to install multiple packages and then just construct my own path. And main path and LD like load library path and such, and my package config path so that things could find each other and build. And uh, and uh, you know this is just this is just superior to that. Uh, and I think you know you can end up with these really long paths. I never blew the path that I was only digging around at home. I suppose never did it in anger. But the idea with the the link bins, I think they call it. It's just that the path doesn't have to be that long. Yeah. But I think systems allow a really long path these days and the searching is also really quick. I didn't, don't even know if that would be... It's it. just a link bin. You just have it like, you know, memoized in case it runs that... Well, this yeah. thing, in a way, it makes it... The link bin makes it easy to roll back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there was another question. Um, is there a way to combine data and config with your packages? So I can imagine you've written, you know, this config that says, you know, this version of Postgres, but you want to sort of tie it to, yeah, say a backup of your you, database or something. You can, um, well, you can make your own packages, and there's yeah. nothing to say that. I mean, packages can have some files in it, yeah. so you can put some files in a package, and that could be your database file, I suppose. Yeah. And then you can you can have a package that. Um, then depends on those two packages, the version of Postgres and your config perhaps, and pulls them together. So this is precisely what I think you should be doing. Mm. Uh, I haven't uh, tried that, though. And then you could have two versions of the same thing installed, and because they were configured differently, they'd have different hashes, yeah. so you could... And then you could do maybe what Mark was suggesting, and yeah. maybe do provenance kind of stuff, saying, you know, yeah. two different data sets. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Uh, that has its own problems though, because if the thing isn't really different, just because it's been configured a little differently, it'll still reinstall the world uh, if if the inputs have changed. So it's just a bunch of software saying that's me over there. Yeah. You could, yeah. Wouldn't it just update? Oh, sorry. Wouldn't it just update log n at the size of the world? Well, yeah, it depends on how high. Go back yeah. Let, let me let me just, uh, just re briefly go back to my old talk thing, and, and just I just want to say before I'm finished, really, because all I've said is Nix is wonderful. Why aren't you all using it, you silly idiots? And um, and I've tried to use Nix for ages, and it's just it's been a real bitch. Um, but it's <laughs> so it's, the thing is it's it's still early, but it's really a really good time just at the moment, particularly if you're doing Haskell, and the reason is because you no longer have to clone the Nix packages repository, it's sort of gone into stable 
and um, it, it's uh, the, the continuous integration server called Hydra it seems to be set up and you will find binary, um, uh, binary packages to, to pull in. Whereas before, even though theoretically you could get a binary package here, you never seem to. You always be building it from scratch anyway. And that's fine because the next time you build it in a, in a different project, it would at least be in your store, but you never even want to build these things yourself, more or less, unless it's your own package, your own private company's package or something like that. Um, so I did want to say that um, at the hack night um, next week, um, you know, come along and I'll help you install it and, and we, can, we can try things out together. And uh, I, I just wanted to say a few things about who, who I found out about Nix from. This guy, Oli Charles, uh, this is actually a link if you ever get my slides. Uh, it's a link to the blog post with that name. And uh, um, it's a bit old now, but I uh, just wanted to give a hat tip to this guy. Uh, and Peter uh, uh, Simons, um, he, he seems to be one of the main developers of the uh, Haskell support in Nix. And he has a really good talk, better than mine. Uh, and you shouldn't be here, you should be home watching it on YouTube, called uh, <laughs> Nix Loves Haskell, and, and you can find the slides. And he's just recently uh, updated the Haskell user guide. It's not, it hasn't quite got into the Nix packages manual yet, but this is a link, should you get access to my PDF. Um, and um, <laughs> you come, come and see me, I can tell you where it is. So uh, one comment and a couple of questions. Um, my comment is, I think Hydra or the CI system actually builds like all the package now by default. Yeah. So if you upload a thing to package, then it'll just be in Nix packages. Or, it, more, or more likely they'll report some dependency issue to you. Because <laughs> um, it, it could be broken, right? Right, um, so I mean, and that happened to me. I got, I got right. a pull request on my GitHub from one of the Nix people or something oh, right. watches the builds and was like, hey, you've got these dependency issues. Yeah. And I fixed them and, and it's in Nix packages. Yeah. So uh, I think that was worth mentioning. That's true. It really is. The the um, the Haskell or the hackage support, so all Haskell packages um, are just kind of like, uh, I showed you the command line before, like cabal to Nix. You, you can just, it's just a one-to-one -one transformation. You just get package and you transform it cabal to Nix and you get Nix Haskell packages. That's how it should work. And um, people are working on doing that for other programming languages. I spoke today with someone who's doing it for F Sharp and, um, and there's stuff out there in Nix land for Ruby if you're into that and all sorts of... No. I don't know about those. No, there are. All right. <laughs> Who wants to use that? <laughs> I mean, no. No, I use Scala at work. Cool. Yep, and uh, a couple of questions. So oh. one, uh, I saw on one of your slides you mentioned BSD, like is it in ports or, or previous it's, it's cross platform. The Nix package manager is cross platform. Yep. I found that when I used it on Mac, that's another downside, it just didn't work there very well. Yeah. Um, it, it worked occasionally and then stopped working again. So um, I, I think that it's definitely there on, on Linux and BSD varieties and uh, the Windows support, at least the Sigwin support, is being revived just as we speak. Um, and uh, so that will be perhaps helpful for some of those F sharpers that don't use mono. Um, so, yeah. Yep. And uh, final question, what is Nix actually implemented in? Oh, bugger. Uh, Perl and C++. Yeah, C or C++, I'm not sure which one. C++. Um, so yeah, interesting, yeah. It is implemented in a, a mishmash of Perl and C. Um, I, I remember ages ago that when I first got into Nix that there is, someone had uh, noticed, uh, remember I showed you there was the Nix expression language, the functional programming language that uh, Nix is. Someone had written at least, I think, a parse and evaluator in Haskell for that language. Um, but that's still in early development. I actually haven't heard anything about it for months, but uh, I think it ought to be <coughs> written in a functional programming language, at least, if not like just a Haskell DSL or something. I don't know. 
But it's the idea really behind this thing. It, this particular tool could be really good. It's certainly useful for hassle development now, but it's the way that package, it's the way that packages should be developed. It, there's just no other way that you should do it. Um, and the, the only other thing that perhaps it doesn't solve is, is, is the whole um, um, working out what, what dependencies will compile. So it won't solve that problem for you. You know, you might have to do something exciting there to work out that. Um, so you either curate a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, dependencies that all compile together or um, use a SAT solver or whatever you want to do. Oh yeah, I was gonna say there's a version of Nix written in uh, Guile called Guix. Ah. Yes, yeah, so there is one written in a functional language if you want to look at it. Cool. Yeah. Those crazy GNU guys. Yeah. Uh, I think they. I don't know if they've rewritten it, but they've written some um, scheme Guile scheme stuff on top. So that if you don't like perhaps the the Nix expression language, you can do everything with uh, parent. Parenthetically, S expressions. Uh, S expressions, yeah. Which you know, I would have really liked, you know, um, I don't know, about fifteen years ago or something. But now I'm just over it, so I haven't looked at that at all. But um, yeah. Well, he was asking. So. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Thanks.